Welcome everyone to AR Live. This is a series of online interactive workshops from Applied Ecology Resources. I'm Professor Mark Cadott, Chair of AR, and I'm delighted to have all of you joining us today for our final workshop of the year. Before we get started, I just wanna say a few things while people are coming into the, uh, the room here. Um, our AR Spotlight this month is on an article published in our journal, Ecological Solutions and Evidence. This novel research by Hicks and colleagues is a great example of how technology can be used to help managers quickly and easily audit their ecological resources in the face of increasingly results-based agri-environment schemes. The new deep learning model cuts floral survey time from hours to minutes and can be adapted to survey other resources such as winter bird food, uh, insect infestations, and tree fruiting. This article can be found in both AR and ESE, and publication of this article is made possible through an AR Platinum membership by the UK Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs. As well as research articles, there are other article types in ESE, including uh, practice insights. This is our bespoke article type enabling practitioners to share their key findings and observations from experience. Whether that is a case study, a protocol, or a more communicative piece calling for new approaches. If you feel like you or your project collaborators have something to share with a broader community, especially following the uh, discussion of today's workshop, please uh, visit our website to find out more. You can see a link at the bottom right, the bit.ly slash practice dash insights to get more information about this article type. We'll share these details again at the end of the workshop. I'll shortly hand over to our speakers for today's workshop, but before I do, here are a few housekeeping rules. The workshop will be recorded and posted online, so please keep your camera and audio off at all times. Please send any questions or comments during the walk workshop by scanning the QR code at the bottom right of this screen now or by visiting slido.com with the code uh, 731319. This will be posted in the chat periodically through the, uh, the talk in case you don't get that. We will share uh, questions with the speakers during the Q&A section after the presentation, where I'll ask the question to the, uh, to the speakers today on your behalf. So without waiting any longer, let me introduce Professor Carolyn Curl and Dr. Jeffrey Semenoff for their talk, Creating and Navigating Successful Co-Designed Research Opportunities. Over to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thanks to Min and uh, Mark and Erica and BES and AER Live for hosting us. So I'm an academic. I'm a conservation biology professor at UC San Diego. And in my lab, we study um, the foraging ecology and habitat use of multiple species with an emphasis on conducting research with Con conservation applications. And Jeff is a practitioner, and he and I have collaborated on two co-designed research projects that involved co-advising two PhD students and resulted in eight peer-reviewed publications. And we've both contributed to many other co-designed projects with multiple collaborators, including a few others that we work on that aren't quite as formalized as the ones we're going to talk about today. And then these projects have been successful for our research, and perhaps most importantly, they've contributed to effective management and conservation of many species and habitats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Jeff Semenoff. Um, as you know, I'm a, the practitioner for this uh, presentation today, and I, I work for a federal agency. It's, it's called NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and uh, one of the subsidiary labs called Southwest Fisheries Science Center in Southern California, USA. And I run a marine turtle uh, uh, research program where we address a lot of different questions related to biology, ecology of, of sea turtles here in the Eastern Pacific, but also via collaboration with academics, uh, we work throughout the world. So it's just great, great opportunity to kind of showcase our, our collaboration today with what Carolyn and I have been up to. So thanks. So first of all, the goal of our presentation is to really just encourage you all to actually pursue co-designed research projects. So specifically, we wanna help you overcome perceived hurdles by pointing out some of the benefits to this type of research. And we wanna detail what we have found to be helpful for maximizing the success of co-designed research. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. 
So first off, what exactly do you mean by co-designed ecological research? So successful co-designed research brings together multiple fields of interest to really maximize the effectiveness of a desired outcome, whatever your desired outcome is. For our purposes in this workshop, we're talking specifically about co-designed applied ecological research conducted via collaboration between academics and practitioners. And by bringing these entities together, we can really increase the reach and the scope of management data, which allows for all interested parties to use this information to its fullest potential and then create the most robust conservation recommendations and outcomes. So this is gonna be a little bit of an interactive talk today. Um, we do have a question for, and the idea here is just to, I think really get a sense of kind of who's in the room, get a temperature of, of who we are and, and can help us kind of craft some of our comments later on today. So um, we have a few questions uh, that we're gonna pop up here that revolve around this question of, um, have you participated in co-designed research projects? And I believe, um, and I'd like to thank Minso for, for, and uh, Erica for helping with this poll. Yeah. I think that should pop up. There we go. Okay. Oh, this is great. I love it. You can see it real time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, so I guess it's not surprising, Carolyn, that you know the the majority here are coming from the academic standpoint. Um, obviously, this is British Ecological Society, so I think it has a little bit of an academic uh, slant to it. But I'm really also pleased to see that we have almost a third of the folks that have not participated in these sorts of projects before. So hopefully you guys get some insights today from, from our experiences. Um, I'm actually surprised. I thought we'd have more practitioners. So um, this is great. So then we'll, we'll hope that, um, we can get the academics in the audience to um, make some overtures to protect practitioners. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this, and close this down. Thank you for sharing that. So now we know who is in our audience and that's kind of helpful for us. Okay. So let's go, let me put it back here. Okay, so just to begin with, it was kind of hard actually for us to come up with some hurdles, but at the outset, we just wanna acknowledge that there are the potential for um, hurdles in, in pursuing this type of research. And some of those hurdles include uncertainty. So you may not know if your overtures for collaboration would be appreciated or welcomed. You may not know exactly how your expertise could benefit potential collaborators, or you may not fully understand the ways in which your research would fit with your potential collaborators. And then second, you may have assumptions about co-designed research projects that we hope to dispel. You may assume your objectives would be at cross purposes for those to those with whom you're interested in collaborating. Practitioners may assume academics aren't interested in doing research with specific management components, or academics may assume that practitioners don't conduct research at creating research publications. <clears throat> Yeah, and, I, and I think that sort of that that barrier, that sort of lack of understanding between the two different groups, it really comes down to in, until you reach out, you don't really know what or if there are barriers there. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a practitioner, it's occasionally I get re, people reach out to me from academia or even from NGOs for that matter and, and ask if I'm interested to get involved with some research. And, and, and by and large, they're pretty surprised at my answer, which is almost always yes. And I think the reason for me that it's always yes, and, and for my colleagues at the lab I work at, is that our federal agency's lab operates under a very academic model. And so things like publication, that's obviously a big currency of success in, in uh, academia. Same thing at our agency. Student mentorship is something else that's incredibly important. You know, at our lab, we have lots of offices with scientists and, and conservation practitioners, but we also have a lot of space for graduate students to come and do their work and take advantage of the facilities that we have to offer. And, and to just add one more um, to this, to dispel um, these assumptions is an obviously huge currency of success for management agencies such as NOAA or other government or NGO agencies is the other currency of success, not just publications, but excellent conservation and management outcomes. Those are extremely valuable for academics who are interested in conducting meaningful applied ecology. Um, and it's important, so it's important to consider these potential hurdles, this uncertainty and these assumptions um, to creating these co-designed research projects, but we're hoping that the rest of our slides will address these potential hurdles and barriers and convince you to overcome any reluctance you may have and really start instigating these co-designed research projects. So first of all, we're gonna just review some of the benefits to co-designed research. And we're gonna speak more generally. Um, and then we're use, where it's useful, we're gonna specifically pull from an example from our shared work. 
um, our co-design, one of our co-design research projects. Mm -hmm. So we co-advised co a doctoral student, Callie Turner Tomaszewicz, who's pictured here with this big turtle. Um, and at UC San Diego, she was in my lab and we co-advised her and she had been working for Jeff and she came to me with excellent ideas for her doctoral research. And so then the three of us entered a partnership that really exemplifies all of the benefits available for co-design research. Yeah, and, and just to, to add on to that is that these sort of co-design projects and the benefits for students, there are also benefits for us in the sense that we can create these sort of champions of co-design research and have sort of these relationships of enduring value. And so in the case of, of Callie, I have to full disclosure, she is now back at my lab as a National Research Council uh, postdoc. She's been there for four years. We hope to have her long term, longer than in just the next couple of years. So these, these opportunities to kind of bring in new colleagues that first started with that co-design research sort of arrangement, like what Carol and I have, to then have them become faculty or postdocs in our labs is just a huge benefit of these sorts of arrangements. Yeah. So we're gonna go through some of these benefits. So the first one is access. So one amazing benefit of collaborating with practitioners and academics is access to resources that both parties can provide. So the type of project, of course, is going to dictate what access to which resources are important. So in this case, if it's a field project, then access to the field sites can be facilitated by one party or another. Mm -hmm. Many of my projects involve field work in very remote places, and access to those places has been facilitated many times over by my collaborators at multiple US government agencies. And this brings up another point that I think is important to mention here is like up until now, we've talked about sort of this uh, academia agency, I can, Carol and I are, you know, the academia agency respectively, but there's also this sort of third branch of this, and that's the NGO community. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to access, for example, a, a lot of the work that I do in, is in Mexico. The, our, grad, our mutual graduate student, Callie, all of her PhD work was in Mexico. And for us to gain access to those field sites, which are often in rural communities where those community members are a little bit sort of leery of outsiders coming in, when you have an NGO that's sort of planted in the field in those areas, it provides an entree for us to get in to have access to those field sites. So again, that sort of third branch, that NGO component can be really valuable in these co-design projects as well. Um, so then the other aspect to mention too is, it's not just access to field sites, but it's access to animals. And I think we're all aware that sea turtles, and I'll just speak on the sea turtle example here, they're, they're threatened and endangered species. In the United States, they're federally protected. Um, there's mandates to have people not touch them, to minimize impacts with uh, development and things like that. And to get access to those animals, um, to, for studying them, you need to get federal research permits. And the federal research permits are, are very rarely, if ever, granted to private parties or to just academics. Usually there needs to be some sort of a, a government partner in that process. And so whereas like green turtles here in Southern California, they occur in the coastal habitats uh, right offshore from our lab and stuff like that, places where people can swim. They're, they, the access for the habitat is there, but the access to actually touch those animals is only gained by having that collaboration with federal uh, scientists like myself. That's absolutely true. And so in my lab um, and Jeff's lab, we work a lot on animals. So that's what our examples are today. This is our main thing. And so these are all pictures of animals that I've worked on or Jeff's worked on. We've worked on together independently. And access to these animals was all facilitated by folks with whom we were collaborating who were either practitioners or academics. And what Jeff said was super true about getting access to animals. But it could be true for field sites too if you're working with plants or other species. So another thing, another access, so collaboration with practitioners and museums is another excellent example of gaining access to archived collection materials. We're currently conducting multiple projects that rely on um, collections of bones and teeth from several agencies and museums. And without that co-design collaboration, we wouldn't have access to these samples. Yeah, and, and like at our lab, for example, we have something called the National Sea Turtle and Mammal Tissue Archive where there's about 1.2 million samples in that collection. And, and one, one academic, a, a, a university professor, something like that, you know, there's a, there's a lifespan of that person's career. Whereas with a federal agency, that spans many careers. And our lab has been there for going on 60 years. So that those federal facilities, um, often they're there so long that they sort of have that benefit of 
collections of archived tissues that just are there for long terms that people can access for various sorts of studies, as Karen Lynn mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, the other access, of course, is is laboratories. And so in our case, um, you know, Carolyn has the expertise with stable isotope analysis, and I, I do that technique as well. But often different labs have different pieces of equipment and, and working together, we can benefit from those, you know, shared resources. And just to give a quick example, like at our lab at Southwest Fishery Science Center, so that what you're looking at here is a micro miller, it's a, a micro sampler. In our lab, it's sort of the crown jewel. <laughs> it's attracted a lot of graduate students to come work with us. And, and what the device does is collects my, minute uh, portions of hard tissues like bones or sea turtle uh, uh, humeri, uh, otoliths from fish, teeth from pinnipeds, things like that. And you can actually serially sample the various annular growth layers. And you can't do that just with a handheld Dremel tool or something like that. So to have a machine like this is just really useful and kind of opens up all these doors for different sorts of research questions that we can answer. And I'll, we'll be talking a little bit about some of those questions in a moment, specifically with some of the things that Callie has done. Um, another um, access benefit is students. So um, access to students, especially graduate students is also increased when you have co-designed research projects. Practitioners typically cannot exclusively advise graduate students but they can do so in collaboration with academics. And of course, there's tons of data indicating that mentoring graduate students is linked to increased productivity in terms of scientific publications and increased personal satisfaction, institutional recognition and other positive benefits. And so when you have access to students, then it can increase the productivity of the practitioner office. Yeah, and, and I think the Carolyn, the key thing there too is that the practitioner has to have you know, strong interest in working yes. with students. Yeah. And for me, I guess I, I love my job. I've been at NOAA for 20 years. Um, I, I mentor a lot of students, but one of the, I guess, frustrations I have is I really don't have that opportunity to be a, a major professor for a student just because the arrangements that we have. So like me working with you, Carolyn, as sort of on the committee and stuff like that gives me an opportunity to engage with students. And, and this sort of model is one that many of my colleagues at our lab have, where we know we can't be the major professor, but we really want to be involved with students. We know that their involvement is just key for us collecting data or for analyzing those data. So a, a co-design research arrangement like we're talking about today is that perfect vehicle for us to gain access to students and additional colleagues. Yeah, these are, this is our, one of our students, Callie, who we mentioned earlier, and then a second student, Liz Hetherington, who we've co-advised. Mm -hmm. Okay, another um, benefit is data access. So, um, oh, Jeff, you were going to talk about access to data. Yeah, and, and it sort of goes back to those collections. We, we talk about this, the fact that a federal institution or a lab like ours is there for, for decades and decades, and so those data sets are just a mass over time, and and I think conveniently for, for us within the within the US government, at least, we are mandated to share these data with the public. And so I would much rather have a colleague come to me and say, hey, can we develop a project together where we can use these data and you can be a part of this, Jeff? The other side of that is that within the government, we also have this thing called the Freedom of Information Act, where if people wanted to get those data, they could fill this FOIA for short, they could fill out a FOIA request and we'd have to give them those data. But it's way better if we have a situation where it's actually a true collaboration than them sort of legally trying to get those data from us. It's a, it's a lot easier too as um, an academic person than yeah. to, to collaborate with you than rather going through FOIA. I was just going to say for me, access to long-term monitoring and other data from my practitioner colleagues has been invaluable for our projects. We have one project right now where access to years and years of um, diet data gleaned from sea lion scats collected and analyzed by our NOAA colleagues are helping us to interpret our stable isotope data of the, from those sea lions. But these data are super invaluable and they allow for this long-term aspect of projects that we wouldn't have as academics. Um, expertise is um, another benefit. And just as with other collaborations, so when you participate in co-designed research, you share expertise among all your participants, right? And But co-designed research specifically targets collaborators of practitioners and academics, and each participant has specialized knowledge that arises from aspects that are particular to their institutional expectations. So for example, practitioners are frequently very well versed in the natural history of a system or a species because they're expected to actually manage these areas and these species, whereas academics are, that are particular um, may have specialized knowledge of a certain technique or something like that that they can then 
use in collaboration with the person who has the expert knowledge on the natural history of a species or a system. Yeah, and I get for me in my in my career, you know, I in some senses I'm a little bit of a one trick pony because I focus on sea turtles exclusively. That's just my job is doing sea turtle work. Um, but the benefits of that for things like co-design research is that I'm really good at knowing sea turtle biology and sea turtle ecology, and I know what questions need to be addressed. And so I can bring those things to the collaboration, help guide sort of the direction of the research questions, and I have some insights that maybe Carolyn or some of the students might not have. That that's absolutely true. I feel like I'm a one trick pony with um, we use a lot of food like isotopes and other techniques to figure out diets, but we've worked across multiple species. And I didn't know anything about sea turtles until I started working with Jeff. And, and I really rely on that because I bring expertise of a different kind to the table. So for ours, we really combined these areas of expertise. And you can see, I, I put a, a couple of pictures from um, one of the papers we published. We combined our areas of expertise to address multiple questions regarding several species of sea turtle. And in this particular case for the loggerheads, we combined forces to figure out that loggerhead sea turtles spend 10 to 20 years in a foraging ground in Baja, Mexico, and the longer they spend in that region increases their chancing of dying as a result of bycatch by the fishery in that area. So it was a yeah. great combining of our of our um, forces, our expertise to come up with yeah. a great applied management. Absolutely. And I hope everybody notices that we have the Journal of Animal Ecology up there. So a very convenient <laughs> place for BES. And just to finish that, I think with um, with Cali, for example, you know, when you when you're a student and you have those both both of those perspectives, it just creates a well-roundedness and an appreciation on the part of that student to understand the value of the conservation practitioner component as well as that academic component. Yeah. Um, another benefit is funding. Yeah, and so with funding, I, of course, with with federal government with like Cali, I was not able to help with her uh, fellowship or her stipend for her salary and things like that. But what I can bring to the table is base funding year after year to provide uh, funds for research equipment or for logistics of getting Cali to field sites. Because very often when we're planning from year to year or particularly with long-term projects from, from five-year period to five-year period, that money is already hardwired into the system. And we just need that student to be able to tap into those funds to get their work done. And we've got some photos up here of turtles with really expensive satellite tags and frequently those types of things are in the budgets for practitioners. I also have a picture of a ship here that as a, U a United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which is another government agency. I've been on this ship many, many times um, in collaboration with co-designed research going up and down the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and it was access to ship time was just given to me because they're going up and down anyway, up and down the, the Aleutian chain. So I was able to get on the ship for free, basically, because my research was co-designed with them and we were working on this together. That's a huge benefit in the in terms of funding mm -hmm. from practitioners. And then uh, finally, funding from the academic and granting agency side. So academics have access to granting agencies that practitioners may not. And so they also we also have lab spaces and equipment and access to funding for graduate students. And so this is just to show that funding can go both ways. So um, I've gotten grant money from NOAA as well. So practitioners can provide funding in more non-traditional ways, potentially, but um, academics can also bring funding to the table, which is useful. Yeah. And I would just say, interestingly, although I work for the federal government, I am not allowed to apply for NSF, National Science Foundation funds. And yeah. those are so important for just many projects around the US and beyond that uh, get funded. I can't get it, but working with Carolyn, we can access those funds in different ways. Yeah. Um, another one is application. So this to me is one of the greatest benefits to co-design research. The work that I do as an academic, we have a mandate in my lab that I've made up that we have to do conservation applications for our work. And I can't do that unless I'm really plugged in with NGOs or governmental agencies who actually do the management and the policy making and the conservation. So for example, this is just some research I did in collaboration with multiple NGOs and the Fish and Wildlife Service for my PhD research many years ago, where we investigated the impacts of invasive rats on intertidal and bird systems in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And the academic re research, we showed this effect of the rats and that academic research led to the removal of invasive rats on one of those islands. It used to be called Rat Island. And then 11 years after the rats were removed, we were able to publish another paper demonstrating that the islands shorebirds and intertidal communities had recovered. 
And none of that applied work would have occurred without these partnerships. We wouldn't have been able to access the islands to get the data. We wouldn't have been able to get the rats removed. We wouldn't have been able to go back and show that the island had recovered. So all of that um, application work is heightened when you do these co-design research projects and join up with practitioners. Yeah, and then another example with uh, with Callie's work that the student that both uh, Caroline worked with is relating to loggerhead turtles. And this is a there's a population of loggerheads along the Pacific coast of Baja, Mexico, which is sort of sort northwest Mexico. And for years, there's been huge mortality and, and bycatch in artisanal fleets, so long lines and drift nets near shore habitats. And we recognize that really to get a handle of like how impactful those mortalities were to the populations, we needed to know how many turtles were there. We needed to know how long they were there for and at what age they got there and left. And so understanding those population modeling uh, components were especially important. And so that's where kind of Cali came in and working with Carolyn is that we developed this technique where we brought skeletal chronology of aging animals through analyzing bone, bone growth layers with stable isotope analysis, where we can identify in each year of life where those animals lived, whether it was offshore or in that hot spot of bycatch near shore in, in, in Baja, to understand those that time res, the residency time for those animals. And that sort of information actually, I think Callie, she's got to have close to the record for the most publications for a PhD project. But so two of her publications in particular were the data went directly into these Endangered Species Act assessments. The data that she had helped us understand the, the uh, generation time of these animals, how long they stayed in those habitats. And obviously that's like hugely important for conservation planning with both Mexican colleagues in the United States. So just a really good example of the benefits of co-design research for on the ground conservation. So we're just going to um, move on from the many benefits we've outlined to some of the keys for successful co-design research. So these keys, along with the benefits we spoke of, are meant to help you overcome those hurdles we mentioned at the start of the talk. So successful co-design projects generally require a willingness to forge ahead with bravery and clarity and trust. So these topics aren't normally addressed when we're talking about furthering scientific inquiry, but they're pretty critical for building meaningful relationships, both among, among practitioners and academics. And it's these relationships then that lead to the successful co-designed research. So first of all, um, bravery. So a barrier to creating co-designed research could just be a reluctance to extend yourself and reach for others that may, may be outside of your comfort zone. So first do your homework and discover who would be good candidates for collaborative co-designed research. Who can add to your expertise or who would provide resources that will maximize returns on your research. And so then once you have these people in mind, then you must be brave and you must reach out to those colleagues and you must propose co-designed work. And, and as a practitioner, when people reach out to when colleagues from academia reach out to me, it's it's I love it. I mean, those are those opportunities to create new collaborations and bring new students on board to address even more questions. So the more yeah. often people reach out, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah, I mean, all they can do is say no, and then you just find someone else. <laughs> um, clarity, this is really important. So it's crucial that you approach your co-designed research with a really clear understanding among all of the different parties as to their specific roles and their specific contributions, as well as the shared vision for your desired outcome. So delineate exactly who will accomplish each component of the research, who will be authors on publications, what order will those authors appear, who, are going, who will collect the data, who will analyze it, who will write the first drafts of the papers, which data will actually be shared, what is the expected outcome of a project. Um, do you want to have peer reviewed publications, reports, direct contributions to management actions, these are all the types of things you've got to work out with clarity. Yeah, and meet early, meet often, address these questions head on, sometimes those conversations are maybe a little bit uncomfortable. From personal experience, and I think many of us could identify like the, the most touchy subject is authorship and position in the authorship string. Um, if we can get those things figured out early on, it just uh, alleviates any sort of headaches later down the road in the collaboration. Absolutely, so that clarity. And then finally, trust. So when you incorporate that clarity really early and often, like Jeff said, in your co-designed research and you establish those really clearly defined goals, the outcomes and assignments, then you can lay down this really excellent foundation from which to build transparency and goodwill and establish trust. Mm -hmm. And this trust really grows over time and it leads to even more co-designed research and more collaborations with these people. And, and I mentioned earlier about our national, uh, the tissue collection where we get a lot of people uh, asking to use it. 
it's very apparent when somebody just wants the data, but they really don't want to collaborate with you. Um, and those are the situations that really undermine trust. So mm -hmm. I would say before you approach somebody, make sure that you have a genuine interest to truly work with them rather than just do the data grab, because that data grab from somebody that has the data, it's really apparent when it's happening. And, and if you're doing the data grab, then you miss out on the natural history and other expertise of the people you're trying to collaborate with. So it's kind of self-defeating in a way. Um, just as this, we wanted to put this up to give you an idea of how wide our collaborations have been and can be. So these are just some of the agencies and academic institutions with which Jeff and I have created and carried out co-designed research. And it, it, it sort of reflects the, the, the sort of triumvirate, the three things. It's the academia, it's the agency work or the, the conservation practitioners from federal agencies like me and the NGOs. And I gave that example earlier of, of field access with NGOs. The, the, the three of those really are the fundamental components of a good co-design project, I think. And one more thing about NGOs. So frequently NGOs also have access to funds to get things accomplished. So for example, the rats would never have been removed from that island without huge backing from the Nature Conservancy and island conservation and other um, groups. So that's another thing to remember too. Okay, so finally, we're just gonna close and conclude to um, with this encouragement to you all to be brave and take those steps to find out with whom your research could expand and then make a plan to contact them and propose collaboration to um, really widen your reach as a scientist and as a an applied ecologist who's interested in management and conservation. Yeah, you know, make send the email. Talk to people at conferences, you know, old fashioned, pick up the phone, call somebody and you'll be surprised how often you'll get the, the answer. Yes. Absolutely. So um, thank you, Jeff, so much. I love collaborating with you and we have many more years of collaboration ahead of us. And I look forward to our continued work. You too, Carolyn. I can't wait for our third student. It'll be great. I know, me too. <laughs> thank you all. And if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, guys. That was uh, that was wonderful. And uh, I, I really like the uh, back and forth banter. It's clear that you guys have been working together for a while. Um, uh, so a bunch of questions did come in. And so um, uh, uh, I don't know if we'll get through them all, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through some of them. And, um, and some of them are, you know, are, 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 are quite uh, uh, general, some of them a little more specific, but let's let's talk through some of them. I think uh, um, some of this dialogue is really uh, uh, interesting. Um, so the first one I'm going to ask is, um, uh, I think a question that a lot of people might have uh, from either side of this partnership. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, are there particular approaches or routes that or channels that you would recommend to find collaborators? So how would someone go about coming into this new? Um, for our case, like we're here in the United States. And so when I want to do a collaborative project, I start to look at, I start to look at government agencies. And I, I have so many contacts now that I think about who has access to what I need. And I go through that channel. So you're going to have to go in online and figure out what agency or what NGO would be most in an alignment with your goals and then start doing some homework online. That's what I would suggest. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with proximity and jurisdiction. Yeah. So figuring out what agency or what lab is nearby where you're working uh, or that system that you're interested in. And then the other thing I, you know, I often tell students, just look at the literature, see what's out there. Yeah. You, usually that practitioner that is interested in co-design projects has published before yeah. and you'll be able to find that through the literature search. Absolutely. That's actually a good point, yeah. Uh, in, in my experience, it's it's also uh, place based, which is we're working in a specific area, which non-academic entities are uh, involved in the area or have some jurisdictional responsibility, whether they're NGOs or or agencies, as yeah, well. Absolutely, yeah. Because we're I'm down here in San Diego, but we do tons of work all over, and it's very important, like especially up in Alaska, to find people who are working there and doing that work and get access. And I'd say that's where, uh, Mark, again, those NGOs come into play because those remote field sites, usually there's not some agency or academic institution nearby, but there's often some sort of a small NGO that's like dedicated to protecting that habitat or the species working there. And they, I'm sure, be very interested to work with folks. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, this one I think is going to be uh, very much dependent on jurisdiction. And uh, I can certainly say something from the Canadian perspective, but 
Have you guys found that external funders are favorable to applications that include co-design projects? Oh, absolutely, because they, they've seen that you're bringing in all of these benefits, access to the species, the natural history, the expertise, you're bringing in someone who already has all these benefits. So you, you've already done half the battle of, of everything they're looking for when they're trying to fund a project. I've been on a couple NSF panels and the co-design projects were very attractive um, for funding because we knew that they would have all the elements in place to actually carry out successful work. Yeah, and from the Canadian perspective, I've noticed over the past decade, especially the past five years, that um, a number of funding mechanisms have been introduced that explicitly target academic, non-academic partnerships. Cool. That's great. And, whether, and whether those are with NGOs or government agencies or, or private industry. Um, and so I, I wonder if that's becoming, uh, or whether or not that's a trend around the world. I don't, I don't have a strong sense, but certainly some places seem to be prioritizing this type of work. I think the co-design projects, it, to be co-design reflects that there's some level of sort of maturation of the project that, that's been thought out, that yeah. all the partners are in place. Now it's just a matter of getting the funding to make it happen. Exactly, yeah. Uh, there's a, a couple of questions about students, um, managing or supervising students. Uh, and, and I guess I'll sum up the questions as, you know, uh, is there a way for practitioners to approach universities or programs to access students? Um, and then the other side of it is, are there any additional points uh, that need to be considered for the super, for joint projects that include students? Mm -hmm. Um, so absolutely, I've been approached many times by practitioners. So I work with Jeff and a bunch of folks at the NOAA facility near here in San Diego, but I also work with folks up in Seattle, Washington, in both in Washington state. And we're working right now to try and find a student that we can co-advise for a big project up there. And they approached me with that. And so absolutely, it goes both ways. Um, but um, I'm frequently approached by the practitioners to try and bring in students. And what was the second question, Mark? What was that second oh, part? If there's additional considerations that oh. need to be thought about for these co-design, for supervising students in these co-design projects. Um, sometimes you have to consider how the practitioner will be on the committee. Um, they might have a joint appointment with the university or they might not. So sometimes you have to get special permissions, but we have not had to be a problem at all. How about you, Jeff? Have you had yeah, it? I, I, for us, I think one of the additional considerations is access to our federal facility. Oh, well, and, that's true. Yeah. You know, the times of COVID and just some espionage paranoia and stuff like that, our federal government's getting it's more and more of a challenge to get non federal scientists access to freely move throughout the building. Not impossible, but, but a little bit more difficult. And with careful planning and you know pre-planning, you know six months out to get that person uh, permission to walk around freely, then you can get it done. But it takes some time to make that happen often. Yeah, yeah that's and, true. And in my experience, there's, uh, like you sort of alluded to, Carolyn, that the, sometimes there's additional processes to getting non-academics uh, recognized to be on committees, to be voting members of committees, different institutions deal with this differently. So you, you do want to be cognizant of the time and processes involved because the last thing you want is be coming up to an important committee meeting and realize that, oh, actually the, the partner is not a voting member and you don't, you don't want to be in that situation if it has to be approved by, you know, uh, university senate or something like that. And it takes six months to process that. And it's not impossible. I think part of the challenge there is that, uh, well, at least with the, the colleagues that I work with is getting a non academic onto the committee is not the issue, but it's getting like multiple non academics onto the committee is an issue. Oftentimes, you're allowed to have like five committee members, one can be the non university member, the others have to be from that institution. So if a, a co design project looks a lot more attractive to me when I can officially be on the committee, both because that's something that I really want to do, but also I've got bosses, I've got performance reviews and things like that. And, and that's another currency of success. So it's, it's definitely better for me to be on that committee if possible. Yeah. And frequently, um, at least in our institution and others I've um, talked to, you can even add extra committee members. I think Callie had like six members. So like, so she could have every expert that we needed. Um, so if, if your institution requires five of them or four or whatever to be from the institution, you can always sometimes bring on an extra person um, as an official committee member. There's lots of ways around this. And, and when you convince your institution, 
for the benefit to the benefits of bringing on that person, um, I don't. It's usually not problematic. Unless they're overly dogmatic or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and even if you're not like a, a voting member, if you're on the paper, that goes a long exactly. way too. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm cognizant of time, but I want to get through two more questions anyways. Uh, uh, one is uh, an interesting one, um, and a couple of people brought this up, which is uh, basically they're saying there's another pillar of partner, which is uh, industry or for-profit companies. Have either of you uh, had uh, collaboration with uh, for-profit or some industry partners? Absolutely. You know, I work for the NOAA Fisheries, the name of it. We work very closely with commercial fisheries here in the United States. I find, you know, fishermen often are better scientists than most of the, the official scientists just because they are out there living their lives on the water. And often, despite the, I think the media portrays industry as sort of combative and maybe not wanting to work for common solutions. But in my experience, I found totally the opposite. I think what industry wants is meaningful collaboration with with practitioners or with academia where they feel like a true member at the table rather than us just trying to gain access to their boat to run some experimental fisheries or something like that so yes thank you for bringing that up I think that fourth pillar is especially important I, I we should have thought of that earlier Carolyn <laughs> well it's funny because I think in a different field of science like say cancer research that is part of it but we don't think of it that much but we did do a big project looking at um, California condors and we were funded by the Montrose Chemical Company because they were they were forced to put funding into conservation for all the degradation they did to the environment. And we weren't, they didn't um, influence our research in any way, but a huge chunk of our money came from them. And it was mandated that they had to pay for conservation research for their, to make up for their past sins. So um, anyway, yeah, but otherwise we haven't done a whole lot, but it's a great, that's a great point. Thanks for yeah. bringing that up, whomever did. Yeah, we, we, we work with uh, uh, some different, uh private companies that do land management, forest management and yeah. cons consultancies. And, and, when I, and I think the one, the one uh, when we're talking about co-design, there, there, there are probably slightly different motivations from uh, private companies and industry. Um, and that's not, that's not to say it's not, uh, uh, you can't achieve good co-design projects, but you have to be a little bit more open-minded and trying to find multiple benefits and win-win uh, outcomes of, of research. Mm -hmm. Um, final question, I know we're getting late on time, is a couple of people asked this, and maybe this is, uh, you know, we can start with Jeff on this one, is really the opposite of what we talked about earlier, which is practitioners finding academic partners, like for, for, um, uh, for people that do want to link up because of, like you guys talked about with the different skills and access to students, how does a practitioner go about finding and communicating with potential academics? I think it's organic. I think a lot of it has to do with pre-existing uh, friendships or collaborations or uh, common interests. Um, I find a big challenge these days with the time of COVID is not having those in-person symposia and meetings, which to me is just so incredibly important to be able to rub shoulders with other potentially new colleagues, old colleagues, students, and things like that. Um, but you know, in, the, in this time where everything's virtual, it really comes down to me identifying, much like it was the other way around, where you, the proximity, trying to find an institution, an agency that is similar, is near the area where you work. I look for academic institutions that not necessarily are in my area, but have particular expertise within their faculty, and then I will read. Oh. I think Jeff oh. just froze. Yeah. We but I think watched. what Jeff was probably going to say is he'll he'll read them the literature, and I think that's an excellent point. So if you're reading papers um, in your work that you keep seeing the same names pop up, and they're at an academic institution, then that's the person that you should go talk to. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing that we I've seen um, increasingly so is that uh, people will reach out to like a research office at a university or a department, mm -hmm. and we'll receive emails from some contact within the university that says there's that side partner looking for someone with expertise in uh, plant diversity and we'll send it out to researchers. So it can also go in through more official channels through a university. Absolutely. All right, um, well, with, with that, um, I don't wanna continue on too long because we're going over uh, the time, but I, uh, I wanna thank you. And unfortunately, Jeff's not here to thank, but I wanna thank Carolyn and Jeff so much for 
uh, for agreeing to, to host this workshop and talking about their experience. I think it's been really valuable to, uh, to, to learn from them. And, you know, hopefully people in this, in this workshop have gained ideas and, and new ways of thinking about uh, co-designing uh, projects with, uh, with partners. So thanks so much. And if you do have further questions, feel free to reach out to me. Easy. Thanks a lot, Carolyn. <laughs> Uh, so that brings this year's AR Live to a close. Uh, so thanks to everyone who's joined uh, joined today's workshop and other workshops as well. Um, we'll take a break over the winter, uh, but in the meantime, uh, please share the recordings of uh, the seminar, the workshop series, with any students or colleagues uh, who may find these useful. Uh, also, please take part in our survey, uh, which we'll send around in due course. Um, and so we can continue to improve the series. Your feedback's very important to us. Um, as mentioned at the start of today's workshop, we encourage practitioners uh, and those who work with them to please consider submitting a practice insights article to share any case studies or useful tools or uh, even just insights from experience. There could be calls to a broader audience uh, to, to think about solutions to problems. It could be uh, opportunities to convey how you or your organization has overcome problems, whether those are uh, to do with very specific conservation problems, to do with uh, uh, overcoming barriers or policy. Um, Authors uh, at the Journal of Ecological Solutions and Evidence are also able to archive any gray literature associated with their submission in applied ecology resources. And this helps to ensure that relevant reports are also discoverable and become part of the permanent record and they're shareable with the wider community. So again, please visit at uh, uh, bit.ly uh, slash practice dash insights. You can see the link there in the bottom right of the slide. Uh, and you can get more information about how to get in touch with us uh, using the contact details uh, on this web uh, site. Finally, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, communicate to you or to remind everyone that this year's Brit British Ecological Society Conference is jointly hosted with the French e Society for Ecology and Evolution, and will be going ahead both in person and virtually. The deadline for the in-person uh, registration is tomorrow. So please don't forget to register uh, and the virtual registration is also open. Uh, visit the URL on the screen here, the bit.ly uh, EAB21 uh, for ver further details. And so thanks again to everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see some of you in Liverpool and to the rest of you, goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs>